the interesting thing too is it, it left a double G uh, tan line uh, when you wore it. So you, you, know, you really were tattooed with a double G. Ah, uh, this first picture. This was taken by Chris Makos, who was Andy Warhol's kind of chief in-house photographer. And by the time I was 18, I was dating someone who worked for Andy at the factory. I was lucky enough to just catch the tail end of Studio 54. That period was, became so much uh, visually part of what my tastes are. I was still developing, I was still young. So it was an important period. It's not my favorite picture of myself. I look awfully casual, which I did not even look then. There I just look like a kid from high school, which I was, and um, I look very young. This was the first collection that I had complete creative control over. I had been at Gucci already at that time for about four years. It had been in my contract that I was not allowed to step out onto the runway. Maurizio Gucci really felt that he wanted the brand to be the important thing and not the fashion designer. So I had this moment where I was there and I could design whatever I wanted because no one was looking over my shoulder and I was very proud of what I did and I stepped out on the runway. That was one of the first collections that I experimented with androgyny. Now, I, I shouldn't say androgyny because that's the wrong word, but I dressed the men in the exact same looks that I dressed the women in and they passed each other on the runway. I showed a red velvet suit, which became somewhat iconic. Alessandra Michele, who's at Gucci now, very politely and kindly revived it for one of his more recent shows. And Gwyneth Paltrow wore it, and it was a bit of a sensation at that time. There were not that many designers doing men's clothes for women, and I think she looks great. I always think you need to create an image where people stop and look at it. In those days, it was all about magazines and ad campaigns. And when your ad campaign came out, everyone really looked at it and took it apart. Today, I think really because of social media and the fact that everyone has a voice and everyone can be a critic, we've come to a point where it's often hard to be creative. It was so much easier in the 90s to be provocative in advertising. The next photograph is me at my ranch uh, outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. I think a lot of people don't realize I grew up in Texas and New Mexico. I ride and uh, that is my horse in the background, obviously just a little bit of it. And uh, I had about 30 at that time, horses. This is a photograph of a Met Gala, which I chaired with Anna Wintour in, I believe, 2003. And uh, I made a dress for Nicole Kidman. That was a Gucci dress, custom made for her, based on something that I had done that season. And Diana Ross is wearing one of my dresses from Yves Saint Laurent. Nicole is so tall uh, that no matter how tall you are, I'm about six foot tall, but uh, you always look short compared to Nicole. I usually, in pictures, make her get down next to me, so uh, I don't look quite so short. Ah, uh, Vanity Fair cover. We had three actresses who were supposed to pose nude for this Vanity Fair cover. Uh, you see Scarlett Johansson and Keira Knightley. I won't say who the third actress was, but on the day of the shoot, she decided she didn't want to be nude. Now, this picture was not supposed to be the cover. And in fact, at this moment, our actress had not yet bolted from the set but I was sitting in for her, showing her exactly what I wanted her to do. So I was leaning in and, you know, with my, my head behind uh, Kira's head. In the end, after the actress left, Annie Leibovitz and Graydon Carter decided to make this the cover. I was actually quite surprised when it came, to, came out, but how often do you get to be on the cover of Vanity Fair? So I was very happy about it. The next picture is a picture of Colin Firth and Julianne Moore dancing in my first film. 
There's a story about this dress. Uh, the, the film is set in the early 1960s, and I needed a dress that was from that period. So our costumer, Ariane Phillips, who's a terrific costume designer, had been shopping for all sorts of things to either use or to be inspired by that dress. Julianne's character was loosely based on my grandmother, who was quite stylish, quite flamboyant, always very chic, always had the latest things. And the most bizarre thing happened. The dress, when I saw it, I said, that's perfect. That dress is perfect. We looked inside the label, and it was from a tiny dress shop in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where my grandmother used to get all of her clothes made, which was so bizarre. So at that moment, I knew, okay, this is the dress. The next photograph is a picture of me and Carl Lagerfeld. I loved Carl. You know, Carl was really the first designer to go to a house that had slipped, let's say, and to revive it. He was the, the very first one that I think really set a trend. I, you know, I benefited from, from that concept at Gucci, Marc Jacobs, at Vuitton. Today, it's, it's quite a popular concept to take a young designer or a fresh designer and put them at an established house. Carl was the first. Carl was also so quick-witted, uh, and I always found Carl to be incredibly warm. Uh, I am a Virgo, a lot of people don't care about their zodiac sign, but uh, I'm a very typical Virgo, so is Carl. There are a lot of Virgos in fashion, Karen Reutfeld, Stella McCartney. Maybe it's our attention to detail and obsession with perfection that ultimately often makes us unhappy because nothing's ever perfect, and if it is perfect, it's only perfect for a second. But Carl was a very good friend, someone I miss very much, and uh, it's a picture of the two of us together. This is a photograph of uh, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. I made this dress custom for her for a state dinner at Buckingham Palace in London. I was living in London at the time. She was an incredible pleasure to dress, and if you've ever met her, a very warm person, a very passionate person. It was uh, an honor and a pleasure to dress her. Ah, James Bond. Daniel Craig. Someone I knew before he assumed the role of Bond. It was incredible. I was able to dress Daniel through all of his Bond performances. And uh, he's a terrific guy. I think he made it a great Bond. And as I said, if you're a menswear designer, is there anything better than dressing James Bond? This was something that Rihanna wore at the last minute. It was a dress from the collection, it was from the showroom, and her stylist called it in. I wasn't even expecting her to turn up in it, and she got out of the car wearing the dress. This dress was made up of tiny pieces of crocodile. Each scale had been cut out and then sewn on to a lycra dress, so that when you pulled it on, you were literally a column of crocodile. Beyonce. Beyonce was in my very first women's show in 2010 or 2011. We've worked together quite a few times. We also see each other in the hallway at school. Our kids go to the same school. I designed something, uh, a, a football jersey that said Tom Ford 61, the year of my birth. Beyonce and Jay-Z loved it. Jay-Z had written a song called Tom Ford in that year. He called me, uh, I was in New Mexico, and said, you know, I'm working on a song called Tom Ford. Is that okay? I said, well, of course. Rihanna coming out of water on the cover of Vogue. Again, you know, if you're a fashion designer and your clothes are on the cover of Vogue, it's pretty great. And again, on one of my favorite women and someone who I think has such tremendous style. The next photograph is Amy Adams on the set of Nocturnal Animals, which was my second film. Her character is incredibly glamorous, and that's what this picture is about. She's an awfully intelligent woman. She also runs an art gallery, and she's being haunted by something that happened between her character and her ex-husband. One of my favorite things as a filmmaker is writing the screenplay. The reason I love writing so much is at that moment in time, it's perfect. It's in your head. 
the actor's doing exactly what you want them to do, the shot is exactly the one you want it to be, the camera's moving in exactly the way you want it to be, the, the music is just right, the feeling that you're trying to convey is clear to the audience, and that's not at all the way it is when you're working. When I bought the current house, it had a really famous rose garden that had been there since the 1920s. We have 500 different roses in this garden. When we redid the house, I redid the rose garden, hired a real rose specialist. We dug down six feet, we put in all of these worms, we got the soil just right, and I chose the roses so that they go in a degradé pattern from a pale color all the way to a hot pink and to a red. Lil Nas, what a lot of style. I mean, again, that guy can wear almost anything and look great. This is actually a woman's suit that he's wearing. I did do a man's version. It was not covered in bugle beads as this one is, but he looked great in this. He loved it when he walked into the showroom and he wanted to wear it. Zendaya. My God, is she talented. I am addicted to euphoria. I had done a series of breastplates for this show, all lacquered uh, in car paint like Jeff Koons' sculptures. They were actually metallic and metallicized and had shown them. We custom made this one for her and we custom made them for quite a few clients. We would take a mold and then create a breastplate that exactly fit each woman. So we made this for Zendaya and I think she looked great in it. I think it's great to be able to dress the next generation of stars. And I think Timothy Chalamet, like the rest of the world, I think that he is an incredibly talented actor. I think we're gonna see him for a long time. He has his own sense of style. And it's never boring and it's never basic. You know, whenever you work with him, he's, you know, very willing to try new things. And this is a silk moiré, gold suit, which only he maybe could pull off on the red carpet. The last picture is a shot of me taken by Annie Leibovitz just this year in a room that I was doing for the Met. The Met had asked film directors to do a room for the reopening of the American Wing, and I am doing the Battle of Versailles which was not really a real battle. It was called that. It was in 1973, and it actually took place in Versailles. And it was a battle between the French designers and the American designers of that time. The general consensus is that the American designers won. Um, at least that's the consensus in America. The French designers, the French couture was very staid, very classical, and American design, Halston for example, was minimal, streamlined, and really ushered in that kind of more relaxed, casual American style and, and proved to the world that America had its own sense of style and wasn't just copying Europe. So it was an important moment in fashion. I think if you're a perfectionist like I am, no matter what you achieve, um, you never really feel satisfied. You never really feel that it was perfect enough. I think you always feel that there's something that you could have done, have done better. And I think that's really one of the things that drives me. I always feel that I could do something better or something more. So hopefully I'll have time in life to try to do that.